February 14, 2018 is a somber, solemn and tragic day on the calendar and one that should never be forgotten. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, joined the ranks of Sandy Hook, Columbine, Paducah, and far too many other schools around the country, all victims of mass school shootings. On that day, 17 people, students and staff alike, were murdered, gunned down in cold blood in their classrooms. The morning turned to anger for the students and their families. Never again became their rallying cry. From them, the March for Our Lives Against Gun Violence was born. We say no more. Their story is both tragic and unique as their movement continues to grow. Here with insight into that horrific day and the activism that was born in its aftermath is Dave Cullen, author of Parkland. Dave is also the author of Columbine, which was considered by most to be the definitive book on that tragedy. And he joins us now. Dave, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. So, so many questions about this book you've written about Parkland, but I want to talk about the activism that we saw from these kids. And so, first of all, how was it that these kids were able to build a movement when the, they managed to succeed where some other high school kids didn't seem like they were able to get the same kind of traction? So many reasons, and it was really kind of the perfect storm of things that came together. But I think the biggest thing, the biggest things are like they started right away, mm -hmm. and, and it was the kids themselves. You know, in the past, it's usually been either parents, it's been politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, after after Sandy Hook was the really one where we were sure this was going to happen, and you know, the Obama administration really got their ducks in the row. He made it a key part of the State of the Union uh, speech, and it turned out like Obama was the wrong person to lead this any politician, and partly because Obama is polarizing, meant half the, half, you know, the mm -hmm. political system would be against it immediately because his name was on it. Um, but really, I don't think leaders or politicians are our leaders anymore. And even after Sandy Hook, um, those kids were too young, you know, God, they're six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't lead this uh, revolution. And we thought their parents would be so powerful. What we didn't really understand is, when we look and see parents, we see, we all see something horrible, we see grief, that's terrible. But when we see the kids, we see the targets, and we all see our own kids, our brothers, sisters, or siblings, and everyone in America sees past targets and future targets. They are the image of who is going to die if we do not get our butts together and do something about this. And when David Hogg, called out America the morning after, and I'm paraphrasing, he didn't put it this way, he put it more gently, but he basically said, adult America, you, are le you have let us down, and you are letting us die. Your kids are dying, and you're sending us to school, and it's not that you're failing, like you've tried these things, like, you've done nothing. It's 19 years in, zero. You're not even trying something, and what the hell? You're sending your children to death. And that resonated because the truth hurts, and everyone knows that. And I've talked to so many gun owners. And, you know, my friend Elise Jordan, who I mentioned in the book, she's a Republican and she's done these focus groups. She said when she came back from Mississippi a month after, after, um, after Parkland, mm -hmm. and they do these focus groups, Trump supporters and non-Trump supporters, the Trump supporters group, and she said everyone in that group had a gun. And most of them had collections of lots of guns. And they were all saying, I don't know about this gun control or this proposal or, you know, that. But we got to do something. And we, the thing is, you know, there was a, this theme, uh, a sting song way back, If the Russians Love Their Children Too. Mm. I think about that now, like, you know, if the, if the Second Amendment people love their children too, and they do, and they're worried too. And David, everybody heard Dave Hogg, and then all the other kids too, was like, we don't all agree what we're gonna, what we're gonna do, but God, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so overdue. And they took off. And uh, America was waiting for somebody to step up, and we did not think it would be children leading us out of this. But hallelujah. Well, when you say that it was sort of the perfect storm, what I uh, find interesting is in the book, you sort of get into what it was that made these kids so equipped to step up to the national stage. Like we're talking, they were in an affluent high school that had, you know, um, a television station. My high school didn't have a television it's station. Mine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, David Hogg had already been working as a journalist. I wasn't working as a journalist at that point in my life. Um, the, you know, like you had all of these theater kids who 
when you think about it, I mean, had become somewhat accustomed of being in front of groups of people and could speak and felt like, you know, they had some, uh, you know, substance behind what they were saying. So what factors was that that they were able to bring? And then also, how did they have the forethought to make it bigger? Yeah, you, you hit the nail on, on so much of it. Like, I know when David, direct, when David told me, he's like, oh, well, I'm news director at w, WMSD. Um, I'm like, okay. And they have like, the, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you have your own TV studio and you, you're, you know, um, you're the director of it. Um, so they've been doing it. And, and, you know, they weren't just drama kids. Like Cameron was like, uh, had lead role, you know, on, on lots of plays. Like as a junior also was doing the semi-pro production outside of school of Spring Awakening on the side. He was directing um, the one act for, you know, going to the state championships. Um, Ryan, when he was a sophomore, started an improv group in the school because he's like, oh, I wish we could do improv. And so his teacher said, like, well, why don't you start a group? And so Cameron, when he was a freshman, came out the first day and joined. Um, they they created a, a satire newspaper. I think the newspaper is called The Eagle Eye, uh, which several of them worked on. But they also <laughs> created this parody making fun of it uh, mm -hmm. called The Cold Beak. Um, and they spent a year doing that, and there was a whole thing of like, you know, the 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 administration was really cracking down on it, and, and got really pissed off about it after a while. And um, Matt told me, so he he was vice president of whatever the school. He had to read the statement of if you know we ever find out who's doing it. He was in charge of it. He was the one <laughs> leading it. And he's like, I'm like, so these kids were doing like all these remarkable things. So they were, um, you know, it's a it's a huge school of like 3,300 kids. And like these were like the most creative kids who were out there in the world. Right. And they had the resources. You know, they ended up working with the, the African-American kids from Chicago mm -hmm. who they didn't have a TV studio. I don't even think they have a newspaper at their high school. They didn't have the resources. So they're really articulate too, but not as polished, not as media savvy. They're not at the same level because they have not had the opportunity to do any of those kinds of things. But these kids at Douglas, um, they were, and sometimes I think it's just weird timing. I think they have some brilliant sort of charismatic kids that just have, I mean, Emma Gonzalez is, she's kind of, she's one in a million, mm -hmm. right? Who happened to be at that, like, I don't think most large high schools, there will ever be anybody who is as charismatic, who's just like, um, you know, she's sort of this singular being who happened to be part of that. They had, I mean, it's almost kind of a miracle. I haven't used that word, I don't know, but it is, feels like a kind of miracle about these different kids who have these different abilities. And also, they found their own roles. I was talking to David about a month out like about 10 days before the March on Washington, which is this huge endeavor. And I was trying to figure out like, you know, how they were doing it in logistics. And I had all these logistical questions and he kept sort of like not knowing. And finally he's like, yeah, I don't do those things. He said, um, you know, I view myself sort of like the press secretary. Um, and I wish I'd use this line in the book. It was something like, uh, I'm kind of the Sarah Huckabee Sanders of this if I didn't <laughs> lie every day. Um, oh. But I, I, that's David. Um, and then I talked to Jackie, who is the implementer who makes this thing happen, like the next day. And I was, you know, she did know all the answers. And I said, um, yeah, I was asking David about it. And she just, you know, cracked up laughing. He's like, yeah, David doesn't know that. He doesn't do that. But he's out there. He's the face, you know, in the media well, doing yeah, it. And, and they found their roles. And they weren't trying to do the different things they weren't good at. That's what part of what made them tick. They were all great at different things. And they found their niches and played their roles. Well, that was one of the things that I thought was so interesting was that uh, not only were they able to, you know, step up into the national spotlight, but that they also had this mastery of social media that I don't think a lot of people were expecting, particularly politicians who might have been on the opposite side of some of these issues. Um, but I also want to get into the book itself okay. and ask, you know, everything happens at a certain time for a certain reason. So why this book now? This book, because it happened. I, you know... The New York Magazine reporter uh, who interviewed me for a, a piece about a week ago had the lucky coincidence of interviewing me about something else in 2017. And I spent about two hours on the phone with him and he said, uh, wow, you're like a different person. Like I talked to you two years ago and you were angry, you were depressed about this, you were distraught and kind of hopeless. And I was like, yeah, I was. I'm like, uh, so it's interesting to have sort of that before picture document because, you know, then we're what, 18 years into this and nothing, no hope, no way out. And I was getting really, really more and more, as the years went by, more angry and kind of lashing out sometimes. Um, 
and when I was on TV, I'd be like, what? What is it going to take? Um, and that, and, and, and we didn't have any way out. It, I, I feel like it's like, like rats in one of those like, you know, mazes that the shrinks do. Like, but there's, there's no way out. And they're just running around in this mm -hmm. maze and, you know, trying to find, you know, the thing. And there is no thing. There's, we're just trapped in it. Um, and those kids just punched a hole in it, the Parkland kids, and said, this way. And, and by the way, they're just sort of like, it actually wasn't that hard. It was like, it was right here. <laughs> uh, but then, it, and they're like, follow us out. And so we did. And I was like, wow, okay, David Hogg. And then two days later, Emma Gonzalez. I'm like, they're, they're the way out. And, and my, my editor from uh, Vanity Fair um, was a friend of mine and knows I have PTSD issues from covering Columbine. He said, uh, he called me on Saturday and said, I know you're not allowed to go to these, uh, but uh, would you consider going anyway? And, um, and I was like, can uh and i like let me sleep on it but sunday morning i was like okay i'm going but i went back because suddenly it felt like there might be a way out and these kids are going to lead america out and like the last people we thought was like kids may like lead us out of the bike but thank god for them and so like i'm gonna go down there and um and write about the kids and and i swore um you know i was like three years late on my book on two gay soldiers and um so i made a deal with my editor first i said um you know, a month, and that's it, not a day more. And Sunday morning, while we were discussing it, the kids announced the March for Our Lives on all the Sunday TV shows. And I'm like, they're gonna do a march on DC and they can organize that in five weeks. And I was really kind of worried for them because I'm like, okay, that's not gonna come off that well. Like, you can't do that in five weeks. Like the women's movement or the women's march, mm -hmm. they had like two or three months. Um, and like, they barely, you know, they had like experts on this, and, like they barely pulled, they did a great job, but it was, it, it was rough, you know, to make that happen. Um, but then I decided like, okay, the march is five weeks away. I'm going to stay till then, <laughs> not a minute more. And then I, I mean, I kind of found, fell in love with them and I like, I couldn't, you know, they made me happy. I, you know, I, I didn't realize how much I was still suffering from the secondary PTSD. I thought I was past it. I had these breakdowns earlier. I thought it was okay. I didn't realize until I saw the after picture. So I was talking to Alfonso, one of my favorite uh, of the kids over Thanksgiving, over the phone. I had a long conversation, almost two hours this Thanksgiving with him about where he was at. And he, I know him really well. So we were talking about me too. And like, I said like, you, you guys sort of healed me. like. I went down there afraid, like, this may, worst case, I might end up, end up in a mental hospital. I, like, really, you know, because I've been, like, on the verge before. Um, and it was so, not that, it was the opposite. Yeah. I, Columbine did a number on me, and this healed me. Not, not cured, just like, you know, yeah. it'll never be cured, but I, really, I'm such a happier person than I was, and helpful, and, like, uh, and it's because of them. And I... I feel like hopefully that was coming across the book because I feel like that's what they were doing Ameri to America. I feel like they're healing America and giving us hope, and, and that's what I wanted to like capture in the book when I decided to do a book that you know this is this is about them, you know, and this is about the birth of a movement. And, and we you know, definitely get that sense from the book. Although I do want to talk a little bit about what you were mentioning with the PTSD, uh, because even though I am now a studio journalist, but I did do my time in the field, and I actually was freelancing and was sent to Sandy Hook to cover that, so I can appreciate. Um, that a lot of times I'm not sure that what people fully understand when you're working as a journalist and you're covering those stories, it gets on you. It just, it gets on you and sometimes totally. it stays with you for a while. It doesn't, I mean, <laughs> you went into the worst one. That is, uh, I'm so glad I did not physically go to Sandy Hook. Uh, I don't know. But I, I, on you, I feel like it gets in me. I hope this is okay to say, but I've talked to so many of the survivors. I've known these Columbine people for 20 years now. Um, their friend, I stay at their houses sometimes now when I go there. Um, it, to me, it's like plutonium that um, got inside me that's never going away, especially for me that first week. I don't know about your experience, like that first week after Columbine when they were kind of the most, to most toxic and just radiating this. And I was there every day in Clement Park with those kids. And I didn't know at the time that I knew it was like sad and sometimes I'd go home and cry, but um, I didn't realize it was accumulating with me. And it's like in your cells, it's like, that's forever, and I'm never getting all of that out of me. Yeah. Um, and I have my, I don't normally have flashbacks. Every now and then, like, well, my, 
first day in Parkland when I stupidly stumbled into the memorial. You know, the kids are kids, and Cameron gave me... Uh, so I got on a plane and went down there, and I wanted to go to this first meeting um, in a park, and Cameron gave me this, like, one-line text message that was, like, the most oblique thing of, like, okay. And I was texting back and forth, and, like, he sent it on the plane. I'm like, okay, I don't really know what this means. And well, what did a, he send you? Well, it's, it's something about, like, at the... Something like the gazebo or something by the amphitheater uh, at Trails End. And Trails End wasn't capitalized. I'm like, Trail... Okay. What? Um, and so I thought, like, <laughs> well, maybe Trails End is a proper not like that's something. I plugged it into Google Maps, mm -hmm. you know, like in the rental car from the Fort Lauderdale Airport, um, and it came up as a place, like, like a mile or two from, uh, I think, two miles from the high school. I'm like, so I drove toward it, like hoping that, like, that's what he meant. And then, um, which was not the right place. No, it was. No, it oh, was. Okay. Or I wouldn't have. <laughs> I had like barely time to get to this organizational meeting before the Tallahassee trip, where all the kids had to come. The vol kids who were going to go. And then I got to the park, and I found. I asked people, and I found there's this big amphitheater. And then I can't remember what he called it, but um, there were like a million places that could. There were all these gazebos, and there were tents set up. And I'm showing other kids, and like, it could mean that or that or that. Or it could mean any of these places. And I'm just like frantically, like a journalist, just like at work trying to find this. And like, and finally, I decided like, okay, stop, take a breath, look around, and take stock of where you are and mm -hmm. where this might be. And I did. And then I'm like, there's a giant cross right there. And it's got a pile of, I mean, I knew instantly it's got a pile of flowers, teddy bears, beads, the whole, I know what these look like. And then I looked over and there's another one, like I think 40 feet away. And everyone is different, by the way, every site. Um, normally they'll have crosses or something. They'll, at, at Virginia Tech, there were hokey stones because they're hokies. And um, at, at, at Newtown, I can't remember, there were some, um, there were angels and then the yeah. bed sheets that they turned into something. Um, but they're always different. Um, usually they're together. And here they were spread out across the field. And I realized I'm not, not at the memorial. I'm in the memorial. I'm standing inside it. And all these people milling about me are mourners. And it washed over me like a wave. And I was back in Clement, Clement Park on that first day. Wow. Um, and I was just, and I like, I think I mentioned in the book, it was like, I really don't wait in the book. It was like, I was on my knees sobbing and like, and, and, and I decided right there, like, I was insane. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be in a mental hospital. This is, uh, I gotta get out of here and I gotta get back on that plane and I just gotta explain to my editor, I'll reimburse them for the plane ticket. I just, I can't do this. Um, and I just cried it out. It lasted about 10 minutes and then I, I felt a lot better. It was like, that's the thing about, by the way, about um, I learned about relapses because I had a relapse seven years out after Columbine. And one of my mentors, who's Dr. Ockberg, who I cite in the book, who's one of the great things, he, he's one of the people who created PTSD mm -hmm. as, a, as a thing. And uh, I got help from him. Um, but he said uh, relapses, and maybe this is useful for people who've been this, like when you have a relapse, you feel like you're back at square one. Because your body, that's, mm -hmm. that's the reaction that it is the same. And it's terrifying and debilitating because you're like, all this work I did, the months or weeks or years or whatever it is are out the window, I'm back there. But you're wrong. Because almost always relapses are a fraction of the time. And so just knowing that, that's what really helped get me out of it. And so like any survivors out there, when you're having a relapse, it feels like you're back at day one, you're not. Mm -hmm. And just you know, you have that conversation with yourself, this is going to be a much shorter time frame. It may be hard to get back out of it, but not like the first time. So I knew that already, partly because I, you know, been <laughs> in 19 years of this. Yeah. I knew that, and then I thought, well, I'm here. I'll go to the meeting, and then like half an hour later, I was like, fine. I'm like, okay. And then I had a few other smaller things, but that was the worst. Um, and like I said, within about a month or two, I would notice it. And Instagram doing my Instagram stories of, in the car. As you do now. Of course, <laughs> right? Exactly. We're all documenting our lives. So I, every time I was down there and in the like car driving between their houses, I'd be like, like, I'd find myself, I'd literally, I'd be like this, I'd be like, so I'm in Parkland, I'm really happy to be here, I'm going to see David now, I just talked to Jackie, and I'm, I'm like, oh, sorry, it's maybe inappropriate that I'm like covering a school shooting, I'm all like bubbly, but I am. Um, and the first couple times I was sort of apologizing, and then I'm like, 
No, I'm happy because I'm not covering the school shooting. I am covering people who are like reclaiming this and going for it. Mm -hmm. And um, they're doing something amazing things and they're amazing kids. I don't know about you, I, I have nieces and nephews and I do all these high school events. Now I go to high schools, I Skype with classes all the time. I'm like, I love kids. They're just, they have wisdom beyond their years and they always shock me with some things I say because adults, we have learned, you know, we say like, oh, take no out of your vocabulary or take can't of whatever it is, yeah. can't out of your, we say that to each other, but like, we rarely do it. <laughs> they already don't have a lot of that. They'll bring up things where instead of, you know, uh, we also say like, oh, we need to think out of the box. They're out of the box. They haven't constructed the box yet. So that's very true. And so like, I got to spend a year with these amazing kids yeah. and watch them go through it. Um, and sometimes when I didn't think they would pull it off, man, did they pull it off? Well, actually, it's really interesting that you mentioned the fact that uh, they, you know, were able to think outside of the box and that they were really, like, not just energizing themselves, but energizing America. Because what I think a lot of people want to know now is what have we gotten from this movement so far? Like, where have they, where have they been able to move the needle on an issue that's just seemed impenetrable? It was. You know, I think the biggest single thing, so many different things, but uh, they made it non-politically toxic. You know, they said early on, to change the legislation, we need to change the legislators. But they also meant either change them or get them to grow a spine. Because most of the Democratic Party has supported gun control, uh, but quietly. And the dirty little secret is most of the Republicans in Congress also in their hearts do and want to vote for most of these things. The Parkland kids' five demands are pretty modest, and most of the country supports them, including most of our representatives. But they are scared to death of the NRA, and the NRA has made it clear, like, we will annihilate you. We will end your political career if you take us on in any of this stuff. And they've been intimidating them to do that ever since Al Gore ran for president on a gun, you know, platform partially in, in the year 2000 and lost Tennessee and West Virginia, which, it's been shown that that actually, the gun thing didn't, you know, flip mm. it, but that's been the thing. And the Democrats have been cowering and doing nothing, and the Republicans have been against it. Um, they needed to change that equation. And this election did that. It did that in so many ways. First of all, you know, I was writing early on, they don't just need to win in November. They need politicians to talk about it and run about it, run on it. So they prove that it's safe. And lots of Republicans in swing districts districts, like in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, both both candidates ran on gun, uh, gun safety. Um, so they had a huge number of wins, but the biggest thing is they proved that it's, uh, it's not just politically to toxic, it appears to be advantageous. And, and, and now voters are voting on it. It used to be asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. So like about five to 10% of people would vote on guns, all for gun rights. Because think about it, people like, me, you, for gun safety, I don't want to own a gun. I don't have a collection. I don't I don't ever think about it. So when I go on election day, I'm thinking about the economy, healthcare, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, all, all these other things. I'm all for gun control, but I've never really voted on it. Climate yeah. change, um, people where it's a gun where like, that's a big part of your life and your identity, they vote on it. And there'd never been a countervailing force. And this year for the first time, uh, gun control had never shown up on the exit polls, not even on the list. Yeah. This year it came in fourth, the number four item, which is ahead of climate change and all sorts of huge things. Wow. Uh, ahead of Afghanistan, first time ever on the list, and most of the people saying they voted on that in support of gun rights. Complete, they have completely flipped the switch and well, flipped that the equation. Is, that is a great note. We're going to have to leave it on. Listen, David Cullen, thank you so much for both books, Columbine and Parkland, um, and for going deep into these stories that sometimes it feels easier just to keep at arm's length. So Thanks. thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for having me. This was really great. For more information on March for Our Lives and the book Parkland by David Cullen, visit us at metrofocus.org.